Welcome to Passion for Sound, the channel dedicated to thorough and honest reviews of headphones, earphones, DACs, headphone amps, other components and accessories. Basically everything audio related except power amps and passive speakers. My name's Lachlan and my goal is to explore and discuss all kinds of audio topics, even the controversial ones, to help us all find more enjoyment from music. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review and today a very exciting review because this is going to be one of the very first reviews out there in the wild about the Gishelli Labs JNOG 2 or J2. This is a DAC that Gishelli have fairly rapidly pulled together but I'm not going to suggest that there's any corners being cut as you'll hear shortly, it's fantastic, but it's been pulled together fairly rapidly in response to the AKM factory fire. So Gino and Sherry over at Gishelli Labs had to quickly scramble to try to find a replacement to the AKM chips while still obviously producing a DAC that they thought was good enough to put their brand to. I want to say a huge thanks to Sherry and Gino for sending the review unit out to me to let me share it with you guys. I've reviewed their Airish amplifier that I loved and interviewed them here on the channel. They're wonderful people and a wonderful company and so it's great to be able to share with you my impressions of the J2. Both good and bad so it's not like it's a biased review just because they're good people. I'll still tell you what I like and I don't like but the good news is it's overall fairly positive. So with that in mind let's jump in and take a look at the JNOG 2. JNOG 2 or J2, and I'm going to call it J2 from now on. The J2 retails for 250 US dollars, which equates to about 315 Australian dollars. That's not including any shipping. It's a fully balanced DAC at that price, complete with USB, optical and coaxial, so fully featured and fully balanced. To get those sorts of features at that sort of price is pretty fantastic. It's not unheard of, but it's still a really good price. To put that in perspective, the shit Modius balance DAC is 199 US dollars. Sadly, I don't have the Modius here anymore. It would have been great to put the two side by side and see just how they stacked up. But the good news is that I love the Modius and I'm going to tell you whilst it's giving away all of the fun of the review, I'm going to tell you now that I love the J2 as well. The J2 runs on an ES9026 Pro chip, which is a slightly older chip from ESS these days, but still a very good chip. The reason it's not using the 9038, which is one of the newer chips, is because according to Gino, the 9038 ran very hot and was not particularly stable. So they've chosen the 9026 because they could get the sound they wanted out of it and know it was going to be a stable and reliable setup. Personally, I don't think there's any issues using a 9026 versus a 9038, in the end it comes down to how it sounds, not which particular chip is in there. This isn't like computers where you're necessarily needing the faster, more powerful processor for instance. In the case of DACs and audio, the differences from one chip to the next are often some of the features built in such as MQA unfolding, maybe some slightly different filtering and the like, but it's not like it's a huge step forward in terms of the sound that it's able to produce. Incremental, yes, perhaps, but not huge. So I'm personally not at all concerned about it using the 9026, and as you'll hear me say shortly, it sounds wonderful, so I don't think you should be concerned either. While we're talking specs and details, the J2 can also take DSD up to DSD 512, so long as you download the drivers for Windows, and it can also take up to 216 kilohertz 24-bit signals through the coax and the optical. So it's an incredibly powerful DAC for those of you that want to run lots of high res content, you can definitely do it through the J2. Knowing that it's got the technical chops to handle what we might be throwing at it, let's now have a look at the interface, the connections, the general design. As you can see, it used the standard Gishelli design of the very simple aluminium extruded cases and the Perspex front and back panels. On the front panel here, we've got a power button which will also cycle through I don't know how well you can see it on the video there, but it'll also cycle through the different LED modes so you can have all different lighting set up in there. I can't see this at all on my little screen, so hopefully you can see it. It moves through multicolored options on the LEDs, as well as some pulsing options. So you've got some nice fun customization available there. 
a long press on the power button will power it down and then obviously pressing it again, power it back up again. Next to the power button, we've got our input button here. Now what this input button does is it allows you to flick between the inputs from coaxial front, optical front, coaxial back, optical back, and USB. If that doesn't make sense, I'll show you in a moment that there's optical and coaxial connections on both the front and back, and those are completely independent connections. So what that means is that you can actually have up to five different inputs coming into the J2. And that's a huge number for a very well priced, fully balanced DAC. Something that I know some people have complained about with previous Gishelli Labs DACs is the input selector indicators, if you like. The LED system here on the front is designed to show you lots of different things, but it is done in a very basic way and requires a little bit of memory. So the way it works is that on the left hand side as you're facing the DAC, you've got the power indicator up the top and you've got the DSD indicator down the bottom. So when it's receiving DSD, that bottom LED will come on. Now at the moment everything's on, probably because I've got nothing connected. When you then look at the right hand side lights, they work in a number of ways. So they will show you whether it's optical up the top and you can have it on once or on twice, depending on whether it's front or back. Then you've got coaxial down the bottom, again, once or twice. And then if they both come on, it's USB. So it's a little bit confusing. You do need to learn how to remember it. But once you know that it's optical top, coaxial bottom, USB both, it's pretty straightforward. The one other thing that these lights do is that the J2 has multiple output levels. You can select it by very simply holding down the input button. When you hold it down, the power light flashes, and the more times it flashes, the more the sound is reduced. So one flash is max power, two and then three are less and less. So that's all you need to know about those indicator lights. It's very straightforward. I can understand some people wishing there was a more clear cut indicator system, but in talking to Gino, it was all about keeping things as simple as possible. And that can be a really valuable thing, both in terms of keeping the cost down, but also keeping the circuits that aren't involved in audio production very, very simple and out of the way of interfering with what's going on in the audio circuit. So I personally don't mind, but I did want to cover it off for anyone that might be put off by that. So finally, moving along the front panel, I've already alluded to the fact we've got an optical and a coaxial connection here. I'm going to unplug the DAC now so we can look at the back. On the back here, we've got a 12 volt input for the Gishelli style Warwart. Now they say Gishelli style because they're really, really tiny. It's one of the smallest wall warts you'll ever find, and my only complaint about it is that it runs sideways. So even though it's very small, it can actually obscure another power point if you've got it on a power board, unless you're able to align it at the end where it won't obscure it. It's a minor complaint, but it does kind of negate the size of it if you can't align it in such a way that it's not crossing over the next door socket. I'll talk shortly about the quality of that power supply, because I have also compared it to a high quality linear power supply, and we'll get to that soon. Before we do though, let's continue the tour. We've got a pair of XLR outputs and we've got an RCA output. So unlike the Airish amplifier, which is balanced input only, the J2 thankfully has both RCA single-ended and fully balanced XLR output. These are run by completely independent op amps, and so you can run them both at the same time. And as I'll talk about shortly, the quality out of the two are both fantastic. Finally, we've got over here the optical for the back, the coaxial for the back, and finally a USB-B socket. Now you don't have to have this with USB. It can be optional. Many of the older Gishelli DACs didn't use USB. It's not because Gishelli hated USB. They were just looking for the right supplier. They've settled on the Amonero cards, and in my experience, it works just fine. Both Exmos and Amonero have their own issues and their drawbacks and also their strengths, so it shouldn't be a reason to buy or not buy a product depending on which USB implementation it has. The good news is the J2 worked flawlessly with no drivers and then adding the drivers allows me to run high speed DSD by ASIO if I want to. Now before we get into sound quality, I just want to flag one thing. Some of you may be thinking, why did they bother putting these inputs on the front? It's ugly, it shouldn't be there, it's really inconvenient using any inputs and outputs on the front. The reason for that I'm assuming is because the historic Gishelli DAC design was designed as a throughput DAC meaning that you had your digital inputs coming in the front and your analog outputs going out the back. 
The idea being you'd chuck them out of the way somewhere and not see them, and therefore you wanted it to be as streamlined as possible and therefore in line. I'm assuming Geno's decided to keep that design available for those that use their Gishelli ducks that way, but at the same time, I think it's great that they've catered for those of us that might want to stack it on a desk and be able to see the DAC. So to my mind, that provides some great flexibility, but it's not a make or break feature either way. With the tour of the DAC out of the way now, let's start talking sound. The overall sound quality from the J2, I would describe as excellent. It's a little bit two-dimensional, which if you've watched a few of my DAC reviews, you're probably sick of me talking about when it comes to Sabre and AKM chips that seem to always produce a slightly two-dimensional soundstage. It's no reflection, in my opinion, of the designer of the overall DAC itself, so much as a limitation of the chips. And once again, just like it was in the case of the Burson Composer, which is much, much more expensive, the sound from the J2 is a little bit flat in terms of three-dimensionality. In all other ways, though, it's very, very enjoyable. It's smooth, there's no sense of glare, there's good detail retrieval and resolution, and everything's well-balanced across the frequency range. Nothing feels like it's emphasized, nothing feels like it's too pulled back, it's just really natural and true to life. One of the tracks I tried when listening to the J2 was Shoegaze by Alabama Shakes. Most of the tracks on this album have a fair bit going on, and what I found was that the J2 was able to provide a good sense of separation between things, it was able to produce the music in a very natural and clean way, and overall the only thing lacking for me was a little bit of three-dimensionality as I've already alluded to. A quick test with something like the Bifrost 2 that does much better with three-dimensionality showed that there was room for for a bit more separation between sounds, but again, I would say that the J2 is about as good as it could be, both at the price, but also knowing that it's using a traditional Delta Sigma chip. I'll put that in perspective shortly when I compare the J2 to the much more expensive Burson Composer. So for now, just know that at 250 US dollars, the J2 sounds absolutely outstanding. As part of my sound quality testing, I always like to compare the single-ended and the balanced outputs to see if you're getting any significant differences between the two. And whilst I've already said both sound fantastic, there was a bit of a difference and not the difference I would have expected. Normally with this sort of a test, the XLR outputs have a higher voltage and often sound a little bit more separated and cleaner and more spacious. In the case of the J2 though, I actually found that the RCA sounded like it was maybe about one decibel louder. I also found that the mid-range sounds were just a little bit more focused. So I don't know if there's something to do with the way the output channels from the DAC are being merged differently for single-ended versus balanced, or if it's just about the fact that you've got two op amps for balance and one for the single ended and therefore it's producing some slight differences. All I know is that both sounded fantastic, neither was clearly better than the other, but they are very slightly different. The nice thing is by having both choices, you can have a listen to both and choose whichever you prefer without losing out on any of the technical qualities such as detail resolution, separation in the sound stage, any of that sort of detail. One other comparison that I like to make when I'm testing DACs is to check if all of the inputs sound basically the same. That was a little bit tricky with J2 because I had to skip past the extra optical and the extra coaxial inputs as I was changing through. So I couldn't always hear an instant jump from say USB to optical to coax. It was USB, jump to coaxial, jump to optical, and then back around again. So it was a little bit clumsy and a little bit awkward, kind of like how my description just was probably. And so it was not as easy to work out the exact variations between them. What I found though was that they're close enough as to not cause me any concerns using any of them if needed. So it wasn't like it was optical clearly superior to the other two, and therefore I'd only want to use it as an optical DAC. I think they were all good enough to be interchangeable. I did feel like optical was possibly slightly smoother and more focused than the mids, and there was maybe just a tiny hint of a lesser black background on USB and coaxial, but it was very, very minor and not something to get hung up about. It may have also been just full placebo, because as I said, there was a bit of a delay between the jump. The good news is, this is a DAC that I would comfortably say you can use with any of the inputs and never think twice. So that brings me to my final sound quality test, which is to check how the J2 performs with DSD versus PCM. So I listened to some PCM, and then I sent the same tracks through, upsampled, into DSD64. 
I chose DSD64 just to keep things really simple for my computer. And what I found was that the DSD performance from the J2 was really excellent. I do think it's a slight improvement if you're able to feed it DSD permanently. I think it actually performs slightly better. Again, it's not a huge jump and therefore not something to get worried about if you don't want to or can't run DSD the whole time, but I do think it was a nice subtle upgrade. Interestingly, I was comparing the Burson Composer and the J2 at the same time with the exact same feed of sound from Rune. And for some reason, the J2 had a beautifully stable response to the DSD, whereas the Composer was jumping around a bit. There were occasional halts in the music, like the computer was struggling with the upsampling, and yet the J2 I had no such issue, so it wasn't the computer. I can only assume that it was perhaps the Amonero interface on the J2 being a little bit more stable and a little bit more effective in integrating with the computer and receiving that DSD feed. Once again, that's good news for anybody thinking about buying a J2. You're going to get a really stable, really effective DAC that also sounds great and can take DSD with no problems whilst also sounding a little bit better with it. So now let's get to a couple of comparisons. The first act that I happen to have on hand that I think is comparable is the Topping D50S. Now this has been around for a while, it's got some features the J2 doesn't have in terms of Bluetooth, it's also got preamp capabilities with the variable output levels, so it's got a few things that the J2 doesn't offer but at the same time, it's single in it only. Being priced identically though, I thought it was a worthwhile comparison. I ran the D50S on a battery to make sure it was performing at its very, very best, because if you've watched my P50S review from way, way back, you'll know that the D50S is susceptible to poorer or improved power quality, and therefore I wanted to give it the best possible chance. I found that generally both were quite comparable in terms of sound quality. I was running the J2 balanced and the D50S single-ended because it can only be single-ended, but as I've already covered off, the single-ended output from the J2 is easily as good as the balanced, and therefore I still think it's a fair comparison given that I've got the same interconnects for both using the AudioQuest Yukons. So I had them hooked up, the sound quality was basically comparable, but I would say there was a better sense of space in the sound from the J2, and the D50S had a little bit of a sense of glare. Where I tended to notice that was things like cymbals sounded much more natural from the J2 than they did from the D50S. Overall, both DACs sounded good, but if I had to choose one, it'd be the J2 every time. Now for the record, I have changed the op amp in the past in my D50S, but for all my testing purposes, I keep it in its stock form with its original op amp. So having tried the J2 against the D50S and deciding that to me, the J2 is the winner of the two, I then moved on to a much more unfair comparison with the burst and composer. So we're talking about a $250 DAC up against an over $1,000 DAC. It's not at all a fair comparison, but I thought I'd see just how good the J2 was. The composer puts out a slightly higher voltage from its XLR outputs than the J2 does, and so I did have to use the preamp stage on the composer to pull back the volume a little bit. That will have reduced its sound quality just a tiny little bit, so do keep that in mind with this comparison. What I found was that the two DACs sounded very, very similar. In the case of the J2, it was performing way better than I expected, and it was nipping at the heels of the composer. The composer did still have the edge though in areas like the timbral qualities, the tonal richness of the instruments, and also just a little bit more space between the instruments and the overall sense of soundstage size. So the Burson composer is worth having if you've got the money to spend more, but the J2 is outstanding for a $250 DAC. As I've already mentioned, also keep in mind that the composer can get a little bit better again if you disable the preamp module and leave it as a pure DAC but there was no way I could fairly compare the two of them because I'd be volume matching in between and would then be using auditory memory, which is not at all reliable. So at this point, the J2 for me is an absolute winner of a system. The J2 with the little airish, which I'm not gonna pull over here because it's currently plugged in and powered up, but the airish stacked on top of the J2 can give you a system for well under $1,000 that is going to easily perform up there with systems costing a whole lot more. I'm not suggesting it's better than a system like say the Composer and the Soloist, but at the same time, it costs so much less. You could have a J2 and an Airish for less than the price of just the composer or just the soloist. It's not going to sound as good, but you're also going to have so much more money to put towards things like headphones. 
So with that in mind, I think the Gishelli Labs J2 and Airish combo is an absolute winner. But before I wrap things up there, I did want to try one more thing, and that was testing the J2 running with a linear power supply. Clay from Geisler Audio here in Australia has been kind enough to send me one of his linear power supplies. Clay's got quite the reputation here in Australia for building some marvellous stacks and marvellous power supplies. So I was really keen to try his new Kraftwerk 2 power supply driving the Gishelli Labs J2. Now because this involves changing power from the wall wart that comes to the J2 over the linear power supply, again I'm working with auditory memory which is not particularly reliable. But that said, whilst listening to If I Had a Minion by Fink, I feel like Probably with the linear power supply, things were just a touch smoother. There was a better sense of a blacker background, I think, coming from the J2. And whilst it wasn't night and day, it was good enough that I think if you were in a situation where you had a linear power supply already and you're able to run the J2 from it, it will be worth a try to see what you think. What the test also showed me was that there's no need for a linear power supply. The difference was subtle enough, unlike with say the Topping D50S where it's night and day. With the J2, the difference is subtle enough that I don't think I would worry about spending the extra on a linear power supply if you didn't have it already. But if you've got the means to add a 12 volt really clean supply into the J2, you might just get an incremental improvement in sound. So to bring all this together, I think the J2 has proven through every one of the tests I threw at it, it's proven to be an outstanding DAC that's incredibly stable, sounds incredibly good, is pretty much agnostic to which input you use, which output you use, what power supply you use. It's just an absolute no-lose situation. Plug anything into it, connect it up to whatever amplifier you want, whether it's single-ended or balanced, running an optical, USB, coaxial, whatever you want to do, however you want to set it up, for $250, US you can get yourself an outstanding sounding balanced DAC. I kind of dread the day that I get a product from Gishelli that I don't like because I'm not going to want to say bad things about it, but I absolutely will if I need to. This is not that day though. The J2 is fantastic. I highly recommend it, particularly for the price. And so now I think there's two products on the market that I would wholeheartedly recommend to anyone looking for a balanced act. You've got the Ship Modius on one hand at $199, and now you've got the Gishelli J2 for $250. I do wish I'd had both of them here to put side by side because I'd love to hear which one wins out out of the two. The Modius is running an AKM chip and the J2 the Sabre chip. So it would be interesting to hear the two side by side, but I think based on my experiences with both, you can't really go wrong with either. In the case of the Modius, it looks a bit more slick and sleek for those that care about that. The J2 gives you a full-sized USB-B socket, whereas the Modius uses micro USB. So to me, they both got their pros and cons. I don't know which I'd choose out of the two. I'm probably leaning slightly towards the J2 because I just feel like it's such a robust, solid little device in terms of having all the different inputs available and the consistency of sound, no matter what I tried, both in terms of inputs and outputs, I'm leaning slightly this way. But that said, I don't think it could go wrong with either. So if you're in the market for a fully balanced DAC, I'll put a link down below through to the Gishelli Labs website where you can go and pick up a J2. Keep in mind this is a new DAC and it may take a while for them to get solid flow of stock, but it is worth the wait if there are any back orders because it's a wonderful DAC and you're gonna love every second with it. Once again, thank you to Sherry and Gino for sending the J2 out for review. I'm really glad that I've had a chance to play with this and I think you've pulled off a small wonder with the J2. If you found this review useful, as always, I'd love it if you'd hit subscribe and hit the like button to help put this video in front of more people like you and help me to keep bringing videos like this to you. For now though, I'll leave you to the music, so happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.